24. We're going to start with Chris as soon as he puts his phone away. <laughs> there we go. We're ready to go. So, commissioners, item 24 is a de department information item. Caltrans and Commission staff met on April 24, 2019 to review Caltrans responses to the comments uh, that Commission staff provided to the draft 2019 State Highway System Management Plan um, at the March Commission meeting. And we, they, Mike Johnson and his staff provided us with nice responses, showed us how they were going to be laid out in, in the new State Highway System, the final <laughs> version of the plan. Um, so responses to these comments have been incorporated into the final plan and will be listed in a separate appendix within the plan. Um, the final plan must be transmitted to the governor and legislature by June 1st, 2019. Uh, Michael Johnson, the Caltrans asset manager is here and he'll provide us uh, with a presentation and be available for any questions for you. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, Madam Chair, commissioners. Um, last meeting, I got the Guinness Book of World Record for the one word book item adoption. Unfortunately, um, it's not going to be quite so quick today, but no PowerPoint. Um, I will say this first and foremost, thank you uh, for the commission for the comments. We got 18 comments from the commission. Uh, the comments were very relevant. They added a lot of value to the end product. Um, working with Terry and Chris, we were able to uh, fully understand the comment drafted up a response, met with them, came to agreement on what these were. And as Chris pointed out, the, all the original comments are in the appendix of the document, as well as the response and a page reference of where you can go to see that within the broader context of the document. Um, we've been working on the 2019 State Highway System Management Plan since April 1 of 2018. It's been 13 months. Um, this is a huge lift, and the reason um, that it takes so much time is that we're looking at 30 different objectives, physical assets, deficiencies, uh, we have to get current conditions, we have to get current inventories across 12 districts, 30 different, 30 plus objectives. We have to go through all of the work that we have going on in the maintenance programs and the shop programs and understand what we've already committed to so that we can understand what's still left to be done and where it's left to be done. This document forms the basis for our future shops, in this case the 2022 shop and the work plan that goes into planning starting July 1 is directly impacted by this 2019 State Highway System Management Plan just like the 2020 shop that will come to you later this year as a draft was was completely um, impacted by the 2017 plan. So each time we're looking at a from the ground up performance-based assessment of what the, where we are, where we're trying to go based on all the commission adopted targets, and what is the gap. And the challenge with this is understanding all of the projects that are going on in the process. We are tracking over 3,000 projects that are in design and planning within Caltrans, not to mention all those that are out in construction that are not yet open to the public. So it's a huge undertaking to go through all of this analysis. Um, but in the end, it's worth it because this analysis is guiding the shop. It is the, it is the analysis that will ensure that we get to the SB1 targets that have been established. Um, and it's the, the document that makes sure that we're putting the money to the right assets in the right places in the state of California. So appreciate all the comments. It's better for it. I'll just finish with the next steps for this document. It, by law, um, AB 515 requires that this document be transmitted to the governor and all legislative members on or before June 1st. So we've got about two weeks. So appreciate the comments. We've got them all in there. We're working through final approvals, and then um, hopefully we'll get this thing out the door. Do we have any questions? Okay, well, you better get to work because June 1st is not very far away. <laughs> Close to the finish line. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. So. Uh, thank you for that update. Now we'll move to item 26, which is an update on Assembly Bill 1282, the transportation. 
Oh, 25. Oh, I jumped ahead. There we go. Okay. Uh, let's go to 25 then, local bridge seismic retrofit. Okay, commissioners, item 25 is an information item, and as noted on the changes to the agenda, you should have a yellow meeting handout for this item. As requested by the commission at the March 2019 meeting, commission staff has prepared, a dra has prepared draft recommendations for the local seismic bridge retrofit program to build upon momentum created in the past year to ensure delivery of the remaining projects within this project program. Um, just a beat, uh, uh, there'll be a kind of a long background to get through this, but uh, we'll get there. At the January 2018 commission meeting, the department reported 51 of the 479 local bridges initially eligible for the local bridge seismic retrofit account funding created by Proposition 1B were still in the design phase. Commission and department staff worked in conjunction with the Highway Bridge Program Advisory Committee and identified 16 projects, so that's the dirty 10 list, as Stephen Mallory used to call it, plus six additional projects that they felt needed scrutiny, and these had the poorest delivery records. And so in May 2018, the commission sent letters to the local bridge owners for these projects, asking them to work with the department to develop a work plan for each project. Um, these bridges are listed in attachment B uh, to this book item, and bridge owners for these projects have entered into project delivery agreements with the department that state if any phase of the project is not delivered as agreed upon, highway bridge program funding could be withdrawn, and any federal funds um, used on the project would have to be returned. And this is consistent with Federal Highway Administration rules regarding repayment of preliminary engineering costs for projects that do not proceed in a timely manner. Um, in the past year, five additional projects have proceeded past the design phase, and the 17 projects listed in attachment C are currently in construction. Currently, there are 30 bridges um, that are in the design phase, and 18 of these bridges are scheduled for construction to hit construction phase by September 30, 2019. Um, these bridges are listed in attachment A and currently have not entered into any project delivery agreements with the department. Commission staff is proposing four recommendations outlined in this book item. Uh, the first would require all agencies who currently have not progressed their projects to the construction phase by September 30th, 2019, that's the end of the federal fiscal year, to enter into project delivery agreements. And that's because, you know, it's been another year has passed. Um, they told us they were going to get them there. Um, they haven't gotten them there. So we need to start monitoring those and get an agreement with them as well. Um, so. In addition to the withdrawal of highway bridge program funding for all projects that fail to meet the agreed upon delivery schedules, commission staff is recommending that all agencies with projects that do not advance be ineligible to compete for funding in the commission's competitive funding program. So that'd be the active transportation program, the local partnership program, only the competitive portion of that, solutions for congested corridors program, and the trade corridor enhancement program. And that would be until the project delivery agreement is executed or the bridge begins construction. We're trying to get these bridges to construction and completed. So one item we wanted to put in, funding for projects within the highway bridge program that have scour critical assessments or structural deficiencies that are prioritized to be more at risk than a project in the local seismic retrofit program won't be restricted. We want to give the highway bridge program advisory committee uh, enough leeway to make engineering judgment calls and we want to make sure that we are, if there's a bridge that happens to be more critical than one of these, we're not taking funding away from that bridge. Agencies, uh, the final one would be agencies must submit final invoices within six months of construction contract acceptance and agencies that do not comply with this requirement would be ineligible to receive other highway bridge program funding until they have provided documentation of construction contract acceptance on the project and have submitted the final invoices to the committee. And the reason this one's in there is that hadn't happened in the past. We had projects out there that were done and the committee didn't know about it because People just didn't fill out their paperwork, so um, we want that there. Um, so commission staff will consider feedback on these draft recommendations and present final recommendations for approval, hopefully at the June 2019 commission meeting. And with that, are there any questions regarding this item? Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Gamani. Just a comment. Uh, congratulations on these recommendations, and it's about time. We put a little pressure on these folks to get these things done because it's been, what, 13 years since we adopted, started this program? Well, it's been a lot longer than that, and it's uh, actually Prop 1B was 2008, so we've been at least 11 years here, um, and, and that was to help them 
uh, get these projects to the finish line, but uh, we've had this project going for a long time. So. Thank you. Okay, so just clarification. So attachment C, those are underway. So yes, we can feel like as long as those keep going, we'll Right, we'll we're continue right to monitor them. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Right now we don't feel we need to do anything with those. Uh, and items B, at least we have a project delivery agreement, so we know somebody's framed it. That's correct. correct. Okay, so we have more hope. Those are, and those those have been entered into, and they were actually attached to our quarterly report. Um, okay. Every one of those project delivery agreements that were just, they were signed uh, by Ray Zhang with the department local assistance and each local bridge owner. So, so safe to assume that those are making progress. They are, um, and and you know hopefully they're going to stay on that path. But we're monitoring. It. Okay. And so the, watch. the highway okay. bridge program okay. advisory committee meets every quarter. We look uh -huh. at these things. Uh, you know we we are monitoring these. And, okay. Uh, along with uh, what the department's been doing. So the real issue then is attachment A. Those are the ones that seem stuck. Right. There's so there's 30 projects there, and and in our view at looking at this, you know it's been a year now, and 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 we do have you know, forecasted dates for those to get to the construction. So in our mind, if they don't get there, as they agreed that they were gonna do in these loose agreements uh, where they submit uh, to the committee, they, they, they submit a survey and tell them here's when we expect these things to be done. So that's, that's a handshake there in itself. And you know, if they haven't gotten them where they need to get them, you know, we need to start applying it additional pressure to them and I the only way I can do that is if we get them into a project delivery agreement and we start holding their feet to the fire on these dates and it might only be a little hammer but if I hit them with it enough and every quarter and they keep getting reminded hopefully you know we're, we're gonna make substantial progress here and get these to the finish line okay well let us know if we can help so appreciate that appreciate the progress we've made so alrighty now we can move on to item 26 Okay, commissioners, item number 26 is a transportation agency information item. Uh, Bruce April, the, transfer, the AB 1282 Transportation Permitting Task Force Project Manager, is here to update the commission on the work that has been done and actions taken um, by the task force over the past year. Good afternoon, commissioners, director, my bosses, director, and secretary Annis. Uh, welcome to San Diego, my hometown. Uh, so I hope you're enjoying our May gray weather. Uh, but I'm here to give an update on the AB 1282 per, uh, Transportation Permitting Task Force. And uh, why is it AB 1282? We start out with what? It's the AB 1282 bill, but it really came from your uh, 2016 report to the legislature uh, that this bill was developed from that uh, asked for uh, 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 efficiencies in transportation project de de delivery, uh, investments in integrated statewide goals and enhancement mobility, and environmental protection. That's a big part of this, because we're working with all the resource agencies. They have, they have different uh, mandates than we do, and how do, those, how do we get those to work together? So uh, that's, that's in, our, uh, in our program, and we are not forgetting about that part. Uh, so the statutory goal of the task force is to develop structured, coordinated process for early engagement for all parties in the development of transportation projects to reduce permit processing time, establish reasonable deadlines for permit approvals, and provide greater certainty for approval requirements. That's in the bill, but it comes right from your, your report. Uh, and this is for state permitting agencies, uh, not all the federal agencies. Uh, the membership of the task force is, is here with uh, all three uh, uh, agencies. Uh, the original uh, bill required two resources agencies and CALSTA. We also included uh, Cal EPA because they're in charge of the Regional Water Quality Control Board, which is one of the permits we need to get. Uh, and it has all the departments under there, including uh, High Speed Rail and then San Mateo Transportation Authority, LA Metro, and World County Task Force. Uh, one of the first things we were able to accomplish is uh, agency agreement, a partnership agreement between the three agencies uh, that was signed in uh, 
August of last year and basically gives direct direction to the task force and uh, the working groups under that task force to work together co collaboratively. Uh, and within that, uh, we were directed to, uh, by the task force to develop pilot projects. And we came up with three different types of pilot projects uh, to study, to look for uh, pinch points, problems, and efficiencies. Uh, type one projects, uh, efficiencies of scale improvements, to me are one of the most important. They're maybe 90% of our work. Uh, simple projects that uh, can require a lot of that still can require a lot of agency permitting, such as culverts. That, that's one of my biggest concerns. When we have to replace, repair 55,000 culverts, uh, there's a reason those need, prepared, need to be repaired. We might not have taken all those on in the past because of the regulatory requirements associated with them and the, and the high cost uh, to deliver those projects. Uh, that's not something we can continue to do. So to me, that's a really important one. Uh, type two are, are more, uh, uh, mid-level projects, mid-level mid -level documents, uh, auxiliary lanes, widenings, interchanges. What can we learn from those level of projects? And where can we get efficiencies from that? And then the type three are the mega projects. Uh, it's, it's hard to study a mega project when those take 10 plus years to develop in a period of about a year, year and a half to do this. But uh, I think we have a, a, a good start on that. Uh, we, we do have and we're refining our interagencies inter agreements. These are funded positions with the resource agencies. Do we need more funding with them? Uh, do we need funding to work on AB 1282? Those are things that are be, be developed and uh, for the budget request. Uh, we completed the interim report in April, which you have copies of. Uh, and it gives the background on the, on the permitting task force, the 2018 accomplishments, and the work plan for 2019. Uh, the work plan for 2019, uh, we have to have a report to the legislature in December. Uh, some big milestones ahead of us are recommendations. What are we actually gonna ask for after we've studied uh, what the problems are, what the efficiencies can be? Uh, you know, what's, what's the bottom line? To me, that's what, that's the push to the finish line, is to get that out of the, the uh, working groups and the task force to agree on that and report that to the legislature. Uh, so we did a permitting analysis uh, work plan for 2018. One of the things we did was built on, build on other uh, processes that were already being done, like the Lean Six Sigma for uh, fishing, US, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, 1600 permits. You know, where, where were we having problems with that? Uh, some great things were found out about that on both sides of the equation, both, both for, uh, from both agencies. Uh, so, uh, many of our uh, applications were deemed incomplete on submittal. Why was that? We looked into that. Uh, we've come up with a kind of a standard uh, 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 application that's agreed to by both agencies. So instead of having a 50% approval rate, we're shooting for a 95% approval rate, and we're already up to about 93%. So, I mean, little things like that that seem simple, uh, but uh, have, been, have been effective there. And we're also working with the California Coastal Commission on improved partnering. Uh, I personally think we've come a long way with the commission. I was the uh, Secretary Annis' uh, representative for almost two years on that, our relationship with with the commission and many of the staff is a lot better than it was. It's one of the hardest, uh, uh, highest bars to reach. Uh, we have good examples of where we've done that here in District 11 and, and other areas, but uh, that is a challenging one. Uh, and we're looking at new process, uh, the, the 401 certifications and, and those applications. Their, their processes are changing now. They have a new, new definition of wetlands. How do we deal with that? They're, they want alternatives analysis for our projects. Uh, working with them, you know, we really don't have alternative analysis for replacing culverts. Uh, we really don't need that for that level of projects. We do for other projects. And do our typical alternative analysis fit their needs? So that's, you know, the game's changing as we're moving forward even, but it's better to address it early while they're writing their guidance than, than later. Uh, 
And then we're looking at our project delivery process for early engagement. Uh, when do we bring the agencies in on some of these projects? Is it during the PID phase, when we're just kind of trying to figure out what the project is? Uh, or or is, it, is it later? Uh, we have examples uh, uh, here in, in District 11, the North Coast Corridor, which many of you toured uh, yesterday, where we did have early engagement with both federal and state agencies. And I think that was one of the reasons we were able to get to get that project approved, a 40-year project and the permits approved the whole project uh, in, into the future. Uh, so that, that's one of the uh, examples of the pilot projects, the mega projects. Uh, the advanced mitigation, which you guys were briefed on a few months ago, I think, uh, how does that fit into this project? We're not trying to take that project over or reinvent it, but, but that fits into what we're doing here. If we can do advanced mitigation, get agreement early on for for what projects can be mitigated at these advanced mitigation sites, what areas are, uh, that goes a long way to delivering uh, timely projects. And then our report to the legislature, like, like I touched on earlier, uh, one of the biggest things is that second bullet, the uh, re recommendations to address permitting challenges. Uh, we, we have to keep in mind the other agencies' uh, laws and mandates and how we can fit into those and make those work with our transportation projects. Uh, I look at this as, these as, there's a lot of opportunities here to, to have better, better mitigation, better permitting uh, from both sides of the table. Uh, we're, we're gonna be seeing a switch with our uh, le leaders here with the uh, uh, secretaries changing. Uh, Secretary Crowfoot attended our last meeting. Uh, uh, Secretary of Natural Resources, I think he invigorated all of us with his, with his uh, 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 in, continuing input through the meeting and engagement, so that was, that was good to see. Uh, he came up with some great ideas, and I'm looking forward to working, working with him and uh, making this a, a successful uh, project. Good work. Okay. Do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Van Kynen. Uh, Bruce, has there been any consideration uh, I think um, you know the work that Michael Johnson is doing of doing the, the transit the, the asset management plan in, ter in terms of doing you know you talk about all the culverts that need to be replaced is there a a way to do those in in say we know that we're going to do 5,000 culverts over the next five years is there a way to permit that in a one blanket permit is that one of the things you're looking at? I mean, I look at corridors where, like the I-5 corridor, we're going to do work all up and down the state. Is there a way to, to say, okay, these do more, uh, do big one permits like you did on the North Coast corridor? Uh, yes, maybe not a statewide permit, but a region permit, uh, a corridor permit where we're batching projects together. So we cover more projects as opposed to individually permitting them which is, you know, we, at staff level, that's what you hear all, those are all individual projects. They're not in our case, and we might do multiple contracts to do multiple projects. So, so we're looking at that. And the other thing is we need to look uh, early on in the project development process, which may take more staff resources, to how, how do we actually uh, uh, fix those projects? What's the footprint at the, at the upstream and downstream sides to access them? Uh, that's where the mitigation gets gets bogged down. So if we can have kind of standard conditions, standard uh, uh, building conditions, uh, plans, and then standard permit conditions, because one of the other things we found with our uh, our analysis is the, the uh, permit requirements differ widely up and down the state. Some are like, oh, there's really nothing here, so you're good to go, just reseed when you're done. Others are, you gotta mitigate it five to one for temporary impacts to a dry desert wash. Uh, you know, so, and I think what we see the opportunity here is, is, is talking about it at, at, at the highest level and a tops down approach uh, to, to, getting, to getting these standard conditions. Uh, so we know what we're up against to begin with and then batching those in groups so we can get more done at the same time. And my second question is, are you looking at situations where you have one resource agency make a, make a rec recommendation I'm thinking of, of an item that's going to be on later on our agenda in State Route 166, where we, and, and this is an example the Commission's heard before, so they'll, 
but we have a bridge there, and the State Water Resources Agency said, you know, you have a pier in the middle of the channel right now. We want you to remove that as you repair this bridge and do a clear span. span. Well, okay, that raised the cost. Well, then SHPO came along and said, well, wait a minute, you're changing the look of the bridge, and so now is this a visual impairment? So we've taken a year to study the visual impairment. Keep in mind, State Route 66 is in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so, so, you know, that's one of those things where it seems like we, we were working at cross pur purposes or we're not, we're not being smart about how we do this quickly. So now a project, you know, the longer a project gets in, in development, the more it costs. It just time is the enemy of, of cost savings. And so I'm hopeful and optimistic that you'll come up with ways through your, what you're doing to, to, to get everyone rowing in the same direction at the same time and understanding the same thing. And, and part of that is that early engagement, is get them to the table early on things like that. So, so those issues are, are identified early in the process, not when, you're, not when your environmental document's done and you're going to get your permits and then you're backing up to potentially recirculate your document because of those changes. So that's one of the things you guys ask for is early engagement. And our example on I-5, I think that, that's how it worked. I mean, you're, you have seven resource agencies in the coastal zone, so it's like uh, herding cats, as uh, Mug Stoll, who was out there, told me early on when he promoted me. Uh, and so instead, they would get together and discuss the issues and come as, you know, instead of seven cats, one tiger, but at least we only had one animal to deal with. Uh, and, and that really helped, but that's that early engagement is, is important, and that those, those are identified, and those, those conflicting uh, requirements from those agencies, how, how to work through those. I look forward to I, I, your next report and what you, how, how it Okay, I, 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 one more thing here, because I kind of forgot about it in, in my talk, was uh, the Type 3 pilot, pilot project and MAKA projects. Uh, I-5 North Coast Corridor is one of the examples we're using as a lessons learned. How do we deliver that? Mm -hmm. how, how, how did the biggest uh, project the Coastal Commission ever approved get a, approved with a unanimous vote with no additional conditions? A, a lot of upfront work, but uh, we're uh, using those lessons with State Route 37 uh, in North San Francisco Bay, which to me, like I saw I-5, has a lot of opportunities. There's, there's a lot of things you can fix there. Transportation, active, active transportation, uh, sea level rise, uh, that you're going through National Wildlife Refuge. There's so many opportunities to improve all aspects of that in that project. It's, to me, it's a very exciting project, but it's a very daunting project and four counties to deal with. And, and uh, but I, th I think with lessons learned, we can help them, and they will be at our working group meeting uh, tomorrow, and then our task force meeting at the end of the month to present their project to to the to the working group and task force. Well, I, I just called into that meeting. I didn't get to attend a person, but I think that Wade uh, was very clear and articulate in his opening statements that his passion for SB1 and where he had been in the governor's office and felt that he had some sweat equity, if I could put words in his mouth, in terms of helping us get to SB1. And I think that really energized the group, too. So uh, at least what came across to me on the phone was uh, a new level of uh, really, let's, let's work together and let's, let's get something done. So the question I would have for you with the State Water Resources Board and the MOU uh, with the Department of Transportation, Will that play a role in helping us? Um, I, I think so. I think, that, I think the funded position of the agencies has been invaluable uh, on, on numerous uh, uh, levels. Uh, one, you're working with the same people. Uh, you're not, your projects aren't going to the bottom of the pile, which we get threatened with sometimes. Oh, no, we got other more high priority projects in front of you. Uh, traditionally, we have not funded the, the uh, regional boards. There was an issue with state board versus regional board. They are willing to work through that. Uh, okay. So the regional boards will, will have dedicated people for that. Uh, some of the local jurisdictions like Sandag have funded those positions and they've been helpful. And you know, a lot of it comes down to the people. I mean, you, you, it's, it's just it's staff and staff working together. But if we have top-down uh, leadership, which we, 
we have been doing this 26 years and, and we've never had that before. You know, I don't think these three secretaries have been in the transportation building at the same time before. So uh, to me, that, that's pretty exciting stuff. Woohoo, good. Okay, great. Well, keep up the good work. So thank you very much. Okay. Okay, now we're going to move on to the information item calendar. Chris. Correct. Uh, commissioners, the next six agenda items, items 27 through 32, are informational items deemed by staff not to raise any issues. Please note the changes outlined uh, for item 27 on the change calendar. And um, individual items on the information calendar will not be presented unless specifically requested by a commissioner. We're good to go? Yeah. Okay. Let's go on to the action items then. Okay, so actually the consent calendar? Yes, <laughs> consent. I'm Commissioners, uh, that's okay. Uh, so there are 12 agenda items, items 33 through 44 that are on the consent calendar. And please note the following changes uh, to the consent calendar items as documented on the change list for items number 33, number 39, and number 44. And with these noted changes, commission staff recommends the commission approve um, items number 33 through 44 on the consent calendar. We have a motion by Commissioner Gardino, a second by Commissioner Burke. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. Okay, now item 45 was withdrawn, right? It has been withdrawn, okay. correct. Everybody knows that. So we will then go to item 46. Okay. Commissioners, item number 46 is a department action item. Caltrans is requesting approval of an airspace lease with the City of Los Angeles for an emergency temporary shelter and feeding program. The proposed freeway lease area is located in the San Pedro area of Los Angeles at the Beacon Street Park and Ride Lot. And this operating park and ride lot has a 7% usage rate during prime commute periods. Um, Senate Bill 519 added streets and highway code section 104.26, which allows the city of Los Angeles to lease this property from Caltrans at a rate of $1 per month. And that would be below the fair market value, um, but uh, with the legislation, we're allowed to proceed on this item. Um, so, um, um, we, we do have someone here from the mayor's office uh, if you would like to ask questions, but uh, commission staff has reviewed this item and um, recommends commission approval and it does require a unanimous vote, so. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Alvarado, a second by Commissioner Tavaloni. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? But abstaining, that motion carries. Okay, we will go to item 47, Chris. Yes, commissioners, uh, item number 47 is an information item. Uh, Mike Kiever from the department is here to present a uh, project delivery update for the commission today. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Mike Kiever, Caltrans, uh, project management. And I'm just here to provide a brief project delivery update. I will provide a more comprehensive update uh, at the June meeting with our quarterly report. So just, again, leading off with um, an overlay of the project development process, as well as our, our risk and uncertainty curve, and the timeline with regard to where our dollars are spent. We start our projects with the greatest uncertainty, and part of what we try to do when we go into the project uh, approval environmental uh, document approval phase is to daylight issues in that PA&ED phase. And so that's where we're trying to reduce the uncertainty, but we're actually trying to flush out issues. And so we'll try to right size our projects going forward and then drive down that uncertainty before we get into the construction phase where most of the dollars are spent. So you can see in the diagram in the white arrows all of the times that we, we come to the commission as we allocate phase by phase and we right size and we make those changes. There are 12 potential actions for each of our projects. If you look at all of the 
um, potential greater than 120s or supplemental. So when you think about it, uh, we have over 3,000 projects, over 12 potential actions. Um, we're able to, for the most part, identify those issues, flush them out, and um, manage those risks as we move ahead. We just went, had um, a project uh, manager academy, and so talking to our new project managers and encouraging them to, to not just take, but to manage the risks, because what we want to try to get, uh, um, make sure that there's a good understanding, is we don't want to tie up the money that we have on all of the just-in cases. So we want to take a level of risk, and then we want to utilize the process to make the adjustments as we go. And those are the types of things that, if we're managing the risk well, we'll bring to you as actions. And when you ask your questions, we can explain to you why these changes are taking place. So as we're getting to the end of the delivery year, this is the time when you'll tend to see more adjustments to our projects as we have the best information we have at the completion of the current delivery year and we're preparing to go into the next delivery year. And so you'll see some actions um, this meeting and you can probably anticipate uh, more in June as we work to try to drive down the risk and uncertainty. So th this is kind of uh, indicated in, in this uh, pyramid that shows many of the project risks are addressed by the project delivery team working together with the project manager. We identify and manage the risks. If you look at the watch list, and we'll provide you an update with the next quarterly report, but there are hundreds of millions of dollars typically identified in the watch list. And if you look, we've looked back and provided you information in the past. It's a small percentage of those um, that in which we actually require supplementals or greater than 120 adjustments. So for the, for the most part, we're able to flush out, identify those risks, address them, and uh, make our adjustments, um, but some of that, again, as we're taking our risk, we will come back to you using the process to make the adjustments with the, uh, the supplementals in the greater than 120s. And we've, we've talked about one of the risks as our program has grown has to do with um, the number of bidders. Um, good news, we are seeing an uptick in the number of bidders and so I know at the time of the workshop, we had a great deal of concern with the bidding environment. And so we, are, we seem to be seeing some adjustment um, to that. We're seeing some new contractors that are also um, uh, seem to be attracted to, to the program. And that's also good news uh, for us. As that curve shows on the right, there is a very strong correlation between the number of bidders and what we will see for the low bid costs. Huh, seemed to have a slide that didn't uh, come across cleanly. I can describe it. So, one of the, we want to encourage bidders to, to um, I think if you're following along with the handout, you can see a kind of a scatter plot. And, and I apologize it doesn't show up on the screen. But if you look at um, each of those vertical lines, those are the actual bids that we received for a number of projects. And what you'll see there amongst the bidders themselves, often there will be a spread of 50% or more in the costs. And what we're asking our cost estimators to do up to six months before the bid opening, predict what the low bid will be, which is a challenge when the contractors themselves, their bids may have a spread of 50% or more. Right now, the bidding environment, if you look, it's actually turned around a little bit. So for the last two quarters, our cost index has come down. 
So last time I, I talked to you, when we were talking about the workshop, we were talking about the spike and how things were going up. We've almost gone back to where we were a year ago with our cost index. Now our cost index can be very volatile. And so we're cautious about trying to extrapolate that too far, but it is very interesting that we've had this spike up for three quarters, and now the last two we've come down, and we're almost where we were a year ago. And so we're not sure what to make of that. I, I mentioned that there are more bidders. That could be good news. The market itself may be changing. Um, we're going to continue to monitor this, but then that's reflected by my next slide. When you look at the engineer's estimate, what Caltrans has predicted versus what the low bid actually was. So back in July, Caltrans on average was 17% lower than the low bid. So, so we were underestimating the cost. The costs were coming in 17% higher. So we were coming to you quite a bit, if you recall, with a lot of supplementals to award. We've made adjustments with our cost estimates. And again, it takes time to clear out the pipeline because the estimate may be four, five, six months old. And then we kind of caught up, it seems, uh, for a number of months. But now we seem to be have flipped it around where we're about 14% overestimating this, this last month. And again, be careful about making too much about month-to-month -month comparisons. The sample size is relatively small. But when you've got this sort of whiplash going on of the cost index, you're making your adjustment. I think part of what we're seeing with the uh, April numbers is back when they were doing their estimate, the news on the street was bids are going up and they're going up fast, make your adjustment. And I think now you're seeing the pipeline where when they did their cost estimate, they were predicting, oh, the bids are going to still stay um, uh, high. And in fact, they've become more competitive and they started to come back. And, and so that's where you're seeing another adjustment. So we'll continue to try to adapt. It is a, a, a changing environment and seems to be changing um, with some volatility. The good news, if, if you, um, Look at the entire year to date. Uh, Caltrans is about 0.6%, 0.6%, within 0.6% of the actual sum of all the engineers, um, of, of the low bids with the engineer's estimate. So we were, we were lower, um, but only by less than 1%. And so the overall program, uh, despite the, these swings, is, is roughly balanced. And so we'll, we'll continue to um, make those adjustments. I don't know how much to attribute to the work that's been going on, but the department um, working with commission staff, you may recall we've talked about this before that we worked together, we got a group together to say, what are, let's look at some best practices, make some changes. We've rolled out the new tools. Um, the training is, is ongoing, both in terms of best practices, but we're also right now in the midst of rolling out our, um, quanti our cost estimating with quantified risks associated with, that, with both the uh, capital and the support cost estimate. Um, we're continuing to develop some business intelligence tools. That's not as far along. I don't think it's influencing any of this currently. And we have um, also an ongoing cost escalation study, and as Clark talked about, that's mostly to adjust the pipeline, not so much for the actual costs themselves. On, on the supply side, we continue to work with uh, the industry. Um, we have uh, an SB1 task group uh, with a number of sub-task com committees working on a number of, of various items. And uh, Janice Salias has been in here earlier to talk about the work that OBEO is doing to try to grow the industry and develop more DBEs and SBEs. And, and when we were looking at this recently, we, you do see a different subset of contractors when you look at the um, smaller SBE list and the smaller projects that we have. And so I remember uh, Commissioner Alvarado, you had asked us to talk about, we, we try to have a spectrum of, of projects, both the small and the large, in order to 
um, take best advantage of the overall contracting community. And we do want to continue to grow that industry in order to get um, uh, competition uh, for, for our projects. So with that, um, there are two actions coming before you in the next couple of items, a greater than 20% and a, a supplemental to complete construction. In June, just looking ahead, I think you can anticipate, uh, again, as all there, the end of the year adjustments are made, um, we'll be, you'll see some more actions, and I'll also report to you on how we're doing with our, our contract for delivery as we're uh, reaching the end of the uh, fiscal year. And that concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions? Okay, I think we're good. We can move thank on you. to the next item. Item 48, please. Okay, commissioners, item uh, number 48 is a department action item requesting an initial construction allocation of $4,742,000 and an additional 30000 and that's in, that exceeds the program about by more than 20%. Um, and an additional 30,000 in construction support for this project. Um, the uh, main reasons uh, for the increases in this cost estimate have been um, noted in the book item for this. And there are, I also wanna point out that there is uh, one change, they changed the vote list for this on the pink list. But with that, commission staff has reviewed this allocation request and recommends commission approval. A motion by Commissioner Tavaloni, a second by Commissioner Alvarado. Is there discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? But abstaining. That motion carries. Item 49, please. Y yes, uh, Commissioners, item number 49 is a department a action item requesting an additional $3,300,000 in construction capital to complete construction on this project. Um, and this is located in the city of Bakersfield near state routes 99 and 58 on the connector. Um, I do wanna point out that it's a financial contribution only project, so it was not eligible for G12 authority. Um, and additionally, this project is located within a main freight quarter with multiple ongoing projects valued at over a billion dollars in various stages of construction. So we don't wanna slow down any of those. Um, uh, the main reasons for the cost overruns on this are problems with a soil nail wall, um, and the additional cost for this operation is $2,475,000, and that's a negotiated firm agreement um, that the city of Bakersfield has negotiated with the contractor on this, so um, that makes him whole for that operation. Uh, the other changes were um, related to asbestos found during field preparation to demolish the Bell Terrace overcrossing and some additional um, unknown buried man-made objects, and those amounted to $550,000 and $475,000 respectively. Um, we do have uh, um, District 6 staff here from Caltrans and also um, uh, folks from the city of Baker Bakersfield here to answer any questions you might have. Um, uh, Additionally, this request, um, if you fulfill it, requires that the city, there's a, um, a cost agreement uh, put together uh, uh, between Caltrans and the city on this, and the city will pay for any remaining cost changes on this project with this action. So um, commission staff has reviewed this allocation request and re recommends commission approval. We have a, goodness. A motion by Commissioner Gometti, a second, I believe I heard first from Commissioner Gardino. And uh, so we have discussion. Yes, Commissioner Van Kanijnenberg. Um, I'd like to include in the, the commission resolution the, 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 uh, the requirement that when the supplemental request is approved, the department and the city shall have agreed to amend the co-op, requiring that any future cost increases in the construction will not come from the shop funds. So that if you could make that a part of the resolution, then I'd be, would you take that as a friendly amendment? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we have a friendly amendment to make the final final, I believe, in brief words. Uh, so is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? We abstaining, that motion carries. So we'll move on to item 50. Yes, Commissioners, item 50 is an information item which um, brings forward the final set of benefit forms required for projects with approved baseline agreements. Um, this item also includes a list of projects um, in attachment C 
that has not is are not yet required to submit a baseline agreement along with the status as to when that baseline will be provided. Um, that just con concludes my short remarks on this information item and I'd be happy to take any comments or questions. I don't hear any questions. Okay, I think we can move on. Christine, item 51. Yes, good afternoon, commissioners. Item uh, tab 51 is an action item to amend the 2019 local partnership formulaic program of projects. Specifically, this amendment will program four new projects nominated by the Imperial County Local Transportation Authority in fiscal year 2019-20. Therefore, this amendment will result in a new total of 24 agencies receiving program funds for 38 projects, totaling 74.7 million. The remaining 45.3 million is available for programming through June 30th, 2021. The item is consistent with the local partnership program guidelines and the adopted formulaic program. Therefore, staff recommend your approval of tab 51 as presented in the staff recommendation. Okay, so this time I heard the first <laughs> motion by Commissioner Gardino, a second by Commissioner Tavaloni. So do we have any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Bit abstaining. That motion carries. We move on to item 52. Chris. Yes, commissioners. Item 52 is a department action item requesting an amendment to the major damage restoration reserve for fiscal year 2018-19 for additional $100 million um, to increase the reservation fund amount to a new total of $640 million for this fiscal year. At the January commission meeting, the commission approved an additional 100 million that was requested and increased the fund of 540 million. As of April 9th, 2019, the department has approved a total of 523,219,405 in contracts. The department is requesting the additional funding to meet the current level of emergency contracts being received. Um, Dennis Agar is here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, commission staff has reviewed this item and recommends commission approval. A motion by Commissioner Alvarado, a second by Commissioner Tavaloni. Any discussions or questions? Hearing none, I'll call for the motion. All, uh, for the vote, all in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? But abstaining. That motion carries. Okay, item 53, Terry. Commissioners, tab number 53 is an action item to approve baseline agreements for six shop projects. Staff has reviewed these agreements and finds that they are consistent with commission adopted guidelines and recommends approval. We have a motion by Commissioner Tavaloni, a second by Commissioner Burke. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Be abstaining. That motion carries. We will move on. Terry, item 54. Uh, tab 54 is a department action item. Uh, requesting amendments to the 2018 shop. As noted on the change list, projects numbers three and four on attachment three were withdrawn prior to the meeting. Staff has reviewed the remaining 111 amendments and recommends commission approval. I have a motion by Commissioner Gardino, a second by Commissioner Alvarado. Is there discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? abstaining that motion carries okay i see teresa I'm ready to go up I there am ready. okay item 55 thank item, you item 55 is an action item caltrans proposes a step amendment to reduce the program amount of the coast subdivision rail corridors improvement project by four million six hundred and thirty seven thousand that is currently programmed in the interregional transportation improvement program in fiscal year 21-22 Caltrans proposes to program these funds to the Coast Subdivision Positive Train Control Project in Alameda and Monterey County in 1920. This, this amendment was noticed at the December Commission meeting as required by STIP guidelines. Staff recommends your approval. We have a motion by Commissioner Tavaloni, a second by Commissioner Alvarado. Is there discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? abstaining that motion carries item 56 item 56 57 and 58 are information items these are step amendments for notice um, all three amendments are proposing to delay projects 
from the FISC currently programmed in 1920. LA Metro proposes to delay the project by one year, Lake County by one year, and Sacramento by two years. This is just for notice and no action is required at this time. Yes, Commissioner Gilmetti. Just, just a comment. I realize there are a lot of circumstances for delays, et cetera, but I, I hate to see delays in projects when we're trying to put money in, out on the street and get these things done. So I would encourage, I'm not trying to pick on these agencies, but all these agencies to, to fight their way through some of what they perceive to be delays so that we can get these projects started. Thank you. Okay, so we will now go to item 59. Lori. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, commissioners, tab 59 is an action item to adopt the MPO component of the 2019 Active Transportation Program for all 10 of the large MPOs that participate in the MPO component of the ATP. As you recall, we adopted the 2019 statewide and small urban and rural components of the ATP at the January meeting. The 2019 ATP was a four cycle. There's approximately 445.6 million in programming capaci capacity available for the program with about 175 million available for the MPO component. Commission staff reviewed all the MPO program submittals for consistency with ATP program guidelines and to ensure that the MPO project recommendations were selected through a competitive process. The staff recommendation includes 59 projects requesting ATP funds of $174,885,000. This includes over $165 million for 53 projects that benefit disadvantaged communities and almost $95.6 million for 40 safe routes to school projects. Commission staff recommendations are consistent with the MPO recommendations. There's a pink errata sheet that includes minor corrections to the staff recommendations. Uh, staff would like to thank all the MPO staff for their hard work and coordination as we are adopting this MPO component a full meeting earlier than scheduled and we are adopting all 10 at the same time. I would also like to thank Anya Allenbacher and Megan Petroselli, the Commission ATP staff for all the work on their program. Staff recommends your adoption of the Metropolitan Planning Organization component of the 2019 Active Transportation Program for the 10 MPOs that, um, as on the staff recommendations in the book item. We have a motion by Commissioner Van Kleinenberg, a second by Commissioner Burke. Is there any discussion on this? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? But abstaining. That motion carries. We'll go back to Lori, item 60. Commissioners, item 60 is an action item to consider segmenting the Coachella Valley Association of Governments CV Link Multimodal Transportation Corridor Project into seven segments. The CV Link project received 10,792,000 in the 2017 Active Transportation Program. The project proposes to build a multi purpose trail in Riverside County that runs 41.1 one miles along the Whitewater River from the city of Palm Springs to the city of Coachella. Right away for most of the segment locations has been secured and acquiring the remaining locations is underway. The proposed segmenting of the project will allow the Coachella Valley Association of Governments to start delivering usable segments as right away is secured. Should this amendment be approved, the ATP funding will be applied to segment one, and the Coachella Valley Association of Governments would be obligated to submit all required ATP reports through the completion of all seven segments. Staff is recommending approval of this amendment. Move approval. Okay, I heard a chorus, but uh, I'm gonna, I heard a motion by Commissioner Tavaloni and at the same time a second by Commissioner Gardino, so we'll go with that. And uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Vote abstaining. That motion carries. Item 61, Lori. 61, this is an action item to consider the funding distribution change for the Kern County Public Works Rosamond Boulevard Pedestrian Path Project. 
The 2019 Active Transportation Program guidelines adopted in May 2018 allows implementing agencies to move funds between programmed phases. Kern County Public Works proposes to move 44,000 in project approval and environmental document funds and 46,000 in right-of-way funds, both programmed in fiscal years 1920 to the plan specifications and estimates phase programmed in fiscal year 1920 and the construction phase programmed in fiscal year 2021. Staff has reviewed this request. It is consistent with ATP guidelines and staff recommends your approval. We have a motion by Commissioner Van Kenneidenberg, a second by Commissioner Tavoloni. Is there discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Good abstaining. That motion carries. Item 62, Lori. Uh, commissioners, item 62 is an action item to consider a funding distribution change for the City of Santa Cruz Rail Trail Segment 8 and 9 Design and Environmental Review Project. The City of Santa Cruz proposes to move $2,250,000 in plan specifications and estimates funds programmed in fiscal year 2021 to the project approval and environmental document phase programmed in fiscal year 1920. Staff has reviewed this request. It is consistent with ATP guidelines, and staff recommends your approval. Move approved. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Commissioner Galmedi, a second by Commissioner Gardino. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? But abstaining. That motion carries. Item 63, Lori. Item 63 is an action item to consider the project scope change request for the City of Arcadia Bicycle Facility Improvement Project. On February 25th, 2019, the City of Arcadia submitted a scope change request for the Bicycle Facility Improvements Project to reclassify 4,280 feet of class two to a class three bike lanes on Sierra Madre Boulevard. In return, the city will add 4,350 feet of class two bike lanes on five other streets and 24,570 feet of class three bike routes throughout the city. The city is requesting the scope change because this, this section of Sierra Madre Boulevard proposed for improvement cannot safely accommodate a class two facility. In addition, the project site is bordered on both ends with class three bike lanes, so the change would make the route more predictable and run more smoothly for users. The city scope change request will have a net gain in walking and biking benefits by increasing both the class two and class three facilities. After reviewing the request, commission staff supports Caltrans recommendation for approval. Staff would like to commend the city of Arcadia for working diligently to try to maximize the non-motorized benefits for this project. Commission staff recommends approving the City of Arcadia's scope change request. Move approval. We have a motion by Commissioner Gardino, a second by Commissioner Burke. Uh, is there discussion? I guess the question I would have, Lori, is uh, Sierra Madre Boulevard hasn't, a road, I, I don't remember if it's Boulevard or Road, it hasn't changed. Uh, so not realizing that it couldn't accommodate that, was that just not level of detail planning? I would say yes. That was not uh, good planning up front. Okay. But they, but they did um, do a lot of work to try to rectify the um, original mistake. Yeah. And everybody's happy? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. No other discussion. Ready for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. So uh, what's the pleasure? It says on my schedule this is end of day one because they have to give me a special cheat sheet here. Or I wouldn't know what day we're on. So <laughs> do you want to keep going? We have three minutes. Okay, on your mark, get set. Do you want to do some more work? Are you ready? The keep working. Let's go. We're diligent servants here. So 64, Teresa, you're up. Commissioners, item 64 is an action item. This is a, a scope change request for a project in the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. The Antelope Valley Transit Authority requests a scope change to their zero emission bus and van pool expansion project. The commission approved the allocation in January 2017 for the purchase of 11 zero emission buses and 10 new zero emission van pool vehicles. 
The van pool vehicles were intended to provide service to job commuters as well as a car sh share program during non-commute hours. Although this was an innovative idea, AVTA found that the current demand for bus commuter service has exceeded the capacity level that the van pool service could provide. Instead of the 10 zero emission van pool vehicles, AVTA would like to purchase four 60 foot zero emission buses that would meet the current ridership growth demand. The additional buses are projected to provide greater ridership benefits while significantly reducing VMT and greenhouse gas emissions. The new scope, the new scope will be a total of 15 zero emission buses. Staff has confirmed that the agency has not purchased or entered into contract to purchase the buses. Staff recommends your approval. We have a motion by Commissioner Tavaloni, a second by Commissioner Alvarado. Is there a discussion? Yes, Commissioner Van Kleinenberg. So I noticed this was done back in 2017. Yes. And it took this long to figure this out? I, I, tell me how, how we wait two and a half or three years to to get this um, to this point. Is this normal? No, that, that is a very good question. It normally, in all our programs that the commission um, is responsible for, we normally do not change scope after allocation. However, this program is a little bit different. This is an agency program, and the commission's responsibility is only to allocate the funds. Um, I did ask those questions as to why it took them two and a half years, and uh, they, they saw the, the demand growing for, for buses, and they thought it was a better, better use of the funds to buy the buses versus the van pool vehicles. So, no, it is not normal, but. Well, since this time, though, we have had the requirement that all our transit agencies meet a, uh, 2040 goal of that zero emissions. So has that weighed into this? I mean, are we really, we're not uh, not serving some folks no. so we could do something and, else. And the benefits are a lot, a lot more with the purchase of the buses. And so for that, we, uh, staff is recommending approval. Um, if you have additional questions, there's uh, Ron Shepard from Rail is here to answer questions. Do we have questions? Do you want to come on down? Good afternoon, Commissioners. <clears throat> Director Berman, Mr. Annis. Um, we understand the concern about the original allocation being in January 2017. Um, but when that, with that original project, the, the bus or the van park was slated to be the, one of the final phases of the entire project, which is about $6.8 million. Um, what we've been doing is working with the agency all along. Uh, they went in and they started working on a contract to buy the vans, but then, like I said, they had, or like Teresa said, that there was increased employment going on at the military base out there, so they are seeing the demand for uh, increased bus service um, being more of a deliverable and better uh, benefits than just the vans. Uh, they have not bought, spent the $40,000, they have not bought the four uh, buses. Um, what we're looking for from projects like this is how can we maximize the benefits? And this, like Teresa said, this is going to increase a lot of the benefits. It's going to decrease more greenhouse gas effects with the buses versus the vans. Um, it is also, um, this represents about 6% of the entire budget um, of the, of the $6.8 million. Um, bottom line, greenhouse gas reductions projections for the 10 vans is only around, and shouldn't say only around, but it's about four thousand metric tons of CO2, whereas the four buses will reduce estimated as around 20,000 um, metric tons of carbon dioxide, plus the fact that it's going to be delivering more increased service to the population, which is growing and there's employment out there that, that can use it. So yes, it does seem like it's been a long time, but 
it was the end of the project, the final phases of the project. And again, a lot of stuff has changed over the course of those two years as they were working on the contract for the vans and they realized that increased bus service would be a lot better more for the community. Do we have any other discussion on this? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? We have standing, that motion carries. Okay, I think with that we have reached our five o'clock hour. So Don, we'll see you tomorrow morning, girlfriend. Teresa wore us out. <laughs> Do I ask for public? No, no public comments. No public today. Uh, it's okay, yeah. Okay. You're okay.